Namaste. Welcome. Welcome to my heart. Welcome to our Sunday Sangha, our Sunday meditation. Once upon a yogi time, in the ever-present now, you can sit and relax. Take a breath. Take a breath. There was a teacher, a guru, if you will, and he had a small ashram, and students came to study. Some of them stayed with him. And one young set of twins came, a boy and a girl. Roberto and Ro. Roberta. Ta and O. Or Francois, Francoise. They came. And he taught them. Day after day, he taught them. And he taught them the sacred science of the Hora Shastras, the science of astrology, the science of looking at life and becoming one with life. He taught them how to see what the future, the nature, what life was going to bring to unfold for them. And he thought he had taught them how to adjust to the changes. But there were two of them and one of him. One twin masculine and one twin feminine. One twin filled with the logical energy and the other twin filled with the emotional energy. So he sends them on a trip. And he says, I'm going to send you around the world. And I want you to come back to me with all of the wisdom that you gain from this trip around the world, around the earth. I want you to go around the earth. And I want you to tell me when you come back, the single most important thing you've learned. Hmm. So off they go. And you know, in India, the part of India they were living in, not all of India, but the part they were living in was very warm. They were living in the south, and it was very, very warm and, and humid and very pleasant, very tropical, very lovely place. And so they went on their trip and they were dressed for tropical weather. They get on a boat and they cross the ocean and they arrive in England, in Europe. Not Europe, excuse me. I said England, that's not Europe. We'll say they arrived in Britain and they get off the boat. And they're trying to get to the ancient places in Britain. But it is cold. Cold and damp and they are freezing. And no matter how they wrap their shawls around them, they were shivering. Absolutely shivering. What could they do? Well, they decided to get back on the boat. The next boat they could get on and leave. So they go across the ocean in another direction. And they land in the North American continent. Far, far north. They get off. And it's really cold. Really, really, really cold. And there's white stuff all over the ground they've never seen before. People called it snow, and it was high, and there was ice, and it was very, very cold. And they didn't have enough shawls to cover themselves, to keep warm. They couldn't cover their heads. They couldn't cover their hands. 
so they get back on the boat. Don't even explore. Get back on the boat. By this time, they're thinking, this is crazy. This is just crazy. We need to go the other direction. So, they go on the boat again. And the next place that they get off is on the very, very tip of South America, on the way to Antarctica. Hmm. Oh, it's a little warmer, but they can tell that they're going through cold again. Cold, cold, cold. They continue their journey. They get to Japan in the middle of the winter. They get off the boat. It's cold. They get back on the boat without looking at anything. Go around the world some more. They end up back in India, in the Himalayas, which they'd never been to before, the very north of India. They get off the plane, not the boat then. And it's cold, and they don't have shawls. So they don't explore. They don't talk to anybody. They get back on and with heaviness, just heavy, 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 sad, heavy. All, you know, tiring, travel can be very tiring. They make their way, meander their way back down to Kerala, to the south of India. And they see their guru. Oh, they're so glad to be back in the ashram. So glad to be back in the ashram. Guruji, Guruji. Oh, it's so good to be home. Oh, they breathe. <clears throat> and so he gives them a little lunch. Welcomes them, says, go, you know, go take a little shower, come back and we'll eat. And they have a little prasad and they sit and they meditate. And then he says, now, what did you see of the world? Boy, you came back mighty fast. What did you see? They look at each other. Well, I'm not sure what you expected us to see, but every place other than this is cold. The people are cold. The weather is cold. You cannot walk on the ground. It is icy. It is cold. There is no place other than this that is pleasant. Oh, really? Did you talk to people? No. Not except unless we had to. If we had to, we did. We talked to them. Only if we had to. Hmm. What was so cold? Well, you know, we had these, just our clothes from here. We just had our shawls. And these places, everybody else was walking around with these things on their head. And they were walking around with these big woolly coats, I think they were. We'd never really seen them. They called them coats. But they seemed to be warm, but it was very, very cold to us. Cold all the time? Must be, must be. It was cold the 24 hours we were there. It must be cold all the time. Hmm. Did you ask anybody? A ask them what? Did you ask them about the weather? Did you ask them what the land was like? Did you ask them about the food? Did you ask them about the music? Did you ask them about the books? Did you ask them to see their sacred places? No. Why? We didn't want them to laugh at us. We didn't want them to make fun of us. We didn't want to seem stupid. So we just kept our mouths shut and got back on the boat and then found a plane and landed in India and it was still cold. And then we came home. We don't ever want to travel again. 
Well, I see I didn't teach you very well. I didn't teach you very well, the Guru says. Did I teach you to adjust, adapt, and acclimatize? Well, you, you talked about that. You talked about that. Hmm. Well, what do you think that means? And the girl says, I think it means to get back on the boat when it's cold. Good thinking. And the boy says, I think that we shouldn't talk to people and we should get back on the boat and we should just come home and stay here and everything will be fine. Hmm. The guru goes and meditates and he realizes he hasn't taught them courage. He hasn't taught them enthusiasm. He hasn't taught them to see others. He doesn't quite know what they learned all this time in the ashram. No, there was a problem, you know, because part of his practice was to send his disciples out into the world so they could see, so they could explore, so they could understand how to live their lives. And these two that had been with him so long had missed the boat, if you will. They missed the boat. They kept getting back on the boat of their opinions. They kept getting back on the boat of their fears. They kept getting back on the boat. What do you call those? Blinders? They're blinders. They kept getting back on the boat of their thumbs, closing their eyes. And there were two of them. And they talked and they talked and they talked. And the blinders got bigger and bigger and bigger. And they missed the opportunity. They missed the opportunity because they were afraid. And they longed only for that which they knew. That travel, you know, can be a great blessing. And the Guru had another disciple whom he had sent off to travel. She'd left about 12 years ago. He was still waiting for her to come back. He knew she'd come back one of these days. And sure enough, the next new moon, after the twins returned, so did she. Bubbling and happy and joy-filled. Oh, oh, Guruji, it's so wonderful to see you. So wonderful to see you. But then, 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 he asks how her trip was. And she tells him of all the wonders that she found. How she had to learn to take her shoes off in Japan. How she had to learn to leave her shoes on when she went into the house in China. How she had to learn that in America, everybody does things differently. There's so many different things to see, so many different people to meet, so many different languages. You know, in one part of that country, in a small area, 46 different languages are, are spoken. Oh, it was wonderful. The beauty of the flowers in the South. And on and on. And did you know, Guruji, did you know that if you go far enough south, why the stars are different? All the stars that you taught us to look at, they're different. They're different. Now the other two were sitting there. Hmm, I don't get this. She had a great time. We had a bad time. We were gone for three months. She's been gone for 12 years. What's going on? And the crew says, what did you do? And the twins say, how did you manage the cold? She kind of looked at them and she said, well, you know, really, it's not so bad. 
You just wear hats and gloves and coats and shoes and, I mean, boots, you know. No sandals in the snow. How did you learn to do that? Why, well, I asked. Everybody was so friendly. Everybody I met was so friendly. Weren't you afraid they'd think you were stupid? Oh. I wanted to know how they lived. I wanted to see how they lived. Guruji taught me to be curious. What was the greatest lesson you learned? Well, every place new I went, I had to adjust. I realized that only some of what I did at the last place was going to work. So I had to watch very carefully, and I had to adjust. And then I had to become accustomed to the place. So I had to adapt to it. I had to change my behavior. If it was cold, I wore a coat. If it was hot, I did not wear a coat. If it was rainy, I used an umbrella. And sometimes when it was too sunny, I used an umbrella. And then I really had to stay for a while in every place. That's why I'm gone so long. To begin to see the way that people think. To acclimatize to their values. So that I could incorporate that into my being. So that I could see into my being. I could see what they were living like, and I could decide what was best for me. And she was radiant, just radiant. She had spent all this time and had all these blessings of receiving from life, of asking the others for help. Now along the way, she saw many people who had things she desired but didn't have. She saw people who had husbands and wives, children, and she didn't. She'd always wanted it, but she didn't have it. But she thought, well, along my way, I'm going to see how other people have improved their lives, what they've done, what have they done? that has brought them this joy. These things I want, how did they bring them into their lives? And she asked, and she listened, and she thanked them. And her cup was overflowing, her life was overflowing. Gratitude, she had gratitude and gratitude and gratitude and gratitude for all that life had given unto her. Now here we are, today, the 22nd of January, 2023, the beginning of a new year in the lunar calendar, the day in which the planet Uranus moves from its retrograde position to its direct position. Ah, moving direct. Uranus knew freedom, new unusual creativity, new opportunities. And we have coming up in March, and I have mentioned this before, you'll hear me mention it again, so you remember, so I remember. We have coming up on the 7th of March and the 24th of March two changes, astrological changes that will make a difference in your life, in all of our lives. And the first is that Saturn will move out of Aquarius into the sign of the zodiac of Pisces, ending the zodiacal cycle that takes 28 years to complete. As it moves into Pisces for the next two and a half years, 
we will see perhaps a healing occur of all the splintering, much of the splintering that's occurred in amongst people. Perhaps there will be more of a return to the awareness of life, the awareness of nature, attunement with nature. Let us hope. But the time gate opens as the planet Pluto, which deals with groups, usins, you and me, and all of the usins, moves into the sign of the zodiac of Aquarius. Aquarius, the water bearer, Aquarius, ruled by Uranus, Aquarius, the future, what the future will bring, new technology, new ways of being and living upon the earth. Change, change, change is coming. Now, the mind does not like change. It truly does not. So what is to be done? You know, some people say, well, that's not true. My mind, you know, I like change. And I say, oh, really? You know, your mind is a creature of habit, of habit. So you say, well, I like to travel all the time. I like to go from one place to another, to another, to another. But you're still doing the same thing. You're traveling. Your mind doesn't have the capacity to sit still. You're just going and going and going. The mind is a creature of habit. The mind becomes disturbed and agitated with change, even if the change is good. You know, the mind becomes a slight bit disoriented. Now, every human being, there are 12 ways in which humans react to change. And it all depends upon how, where the moon last was before you were born. And you can react to change and you can think that change is going to bring you more change. You can react to change and say, ah, I'm doing this with enthusiasm. I'm enthusiastic about change. change comes, talk. You want to talk about it. You want to talk about it. You want to talk about it. Change comes. You want to fight about it. You want to argue. You want to fight about it. Change comes and it's always bad. And it takes you a year or two to get comfortable with a new situation. Change comes and it's wonderful. You feel that every change is good. Sometimes too much so, so that you don't adjust to it. Change comes and more love and beauty comes into your life. Or you view it as more loving and beautiful. Now, what do you want? How do you want to react to change? And how do you react to change? This is important to know. How do you react to change? Well, you know, you can look at your life experiences easily and say, oh yes, this happens every time some big change comes. My mind takes a while to get adjusted. Or I adjust very readily, very easily. But what can be done? to soften karma, to make your life more harmonious, to make your life more joy-filled, to make your life more hopeful. You want hope in your life. We all need hope. To realize that the road is clear for a while and then there's a little bit of a rock there or a little bit of a bump. To realize that the road is clear for a while and then maybe there's a boulder that you have to climb over. You know, The road is clear for a while and maybe you come to a stream 
and you think you can wade across the stream, and you fall in. And you have to drag yourself up and get on the other side. What is of benefit? Become curious about your life. Become curious about life. Not nosy. Not nosy. Curious. Enthusiastic. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? I wonder why they're doing this. I see. Oh, I see that family down the block. Yes, they take care of their elders in a different way. Oh, I see this family down the block. They really value music. Oh, you know my neighbor? Why, she has a harp and two pianos in her house. Three pianos, two in one room. What does she value? Is she happy? Watch and become curious. And I don't mean um, watch reality shows, but learn from the people around you. Watch the people you work with. Watch the people who you are friends with. Watch your family. How are they reacting? How are they dealing with the problems in their lives? Don't judge. Don't judge. But pick up their wisdom. Oh, yes, maybe I can remember that. Oh, yes, maybe I can remember that kindness so that I can be kinder. Hmm. I see when I have that problem or that symbolic problem, perhaps I can do what they did. Or, as my guru said, you look and you say, oh, no, 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 no. That's not for me. That is not for me. Either way, you're learning. Become curious about your life. It's yours. You should be more curious and more enthusiastic about your life than about anybody else's. You should be more curious about how this works. Not mine, but yours. How your mind-body complex works. Become curious about it. Are you eating food that makes you dream wonderful dreams? Are you eating food that makes your mind work really well and you can study longer? You have more physical energy, you can go out and walk and hike in the woods or go for a run or dance? Or are you maybe eating food that makes you kind of draggy and kind of upset stomach so your mind is pretty irritated all the time? Observe it. Observe it. Observe your behavior and the effect of it. Now, write it down. Write it down. And then consider your life, this great sadhana, this great opportunity for sadhana, because it is the greatest opportunity that you have for spiritual practice is in your everyday life. Absolutely the greatest opportunity. For with that, you can see, oh, you know, when I ate that sandwich, my mind, it upset my stomach and I was irritated for two days. Maybe I shouldn't eat that sandwich again. You know, I met someone, I guess it's been about 10 years now, 10 years ago, and he told me, his wife was there, he told me that every day of his work life, every single day of his work life, since he had been married, he stopped at a Golden Arches for dinner and had a burger and fries and a shake. Same thing every day, five days a week. And I said, I, you know, doesn't she like to cook? He says, I just prefer to eat this. 
she cooks for everybody else and I eat her food on the weekends and I prefer to eat this. Oh, I wanted to ask him so much. And how is that working for you? How is that working for you? Now, I didn't. I didn't ask. I didn't know how to say it politely, but I'm still astonished by it. I said, do, do, do you have any variation? You know, I mean, do you, do you get different kinds of shakes? Do you get different kinds of sandwiches? No. Same thing. Made the same way. Every day I stop on my way home from work. Wow. What would your life be like if you could apply that consistency to meditation? What would your life be like if you could apply that consistency to chanting mantra? What would your life be like if you could apply that consistency to forgiveness, to forgiving those who don't have the same opinion as you? What would your life be like? Do an experiment and try it. Don't eat the food, the same food every day, this food that's poisonous for the body. But try. What can you do? What can you learn from others? Always hold this feeling of curiosity, like the disciple that traveled for 12 years. Hold the feeling of curiosity. If you take your ego and you put it aside, you will allow yourself always to ask others, to be able to ask others. Ah, hey, I, I saw, you know, you can do this. Would you tell me how to do that? You went here. How was that? How did you like it? You don't have to like what they like, but become curious in the sense of wishing to learn about life. The last day of my, my beloved father, uh, the last day he was here in this incarnation, we were talking, and just the two of us, and I said, well, you know, Papa, what do you think? You know, is there anything else you wanted to do? No, I, no, it's pretty good. So well, what are you thinking? He says, oh, I'm curious about what the great beyond is going to bring. I'm so curious. That's a great thing. It's a great feeling state to have. And he said it many times over that short time that we were together. In the short time, it was, a, you know, three hours. It felt like it was a blink of an eye. And he said it the next day, right before he left. Become curious. Now, here's a rub. The great science of, of astrology shows us that we have an ascendant and it is the way that each of us look at the world. You're born with this and it's a way one would call it a filter through which you look at the world. So you may have a filter of, of um, I am, I have, I communicate, those kinds of filters. But as you walk through time, those filters are laid upon the one that you're born with. So you have a first filter, and then as you go through time, there's another filter that temporarily goes past those over the first one. But what you want to do spiritually, mystically, is ascend above, above. You don't want to stay at the same level. You don't want to meditate here, or here, or here, or even here, above, above, above the chakric system so you can see it all. So you know that when change comes, which it does, change, all is change upon the earth plane. All is change. And the reason that people become so sad and despondent is they don't realize that. They forget. 
they have forgotten that all is change. Even change itself will be change. And so we need to find the way to stay steady in the midst of change. You know the answer. It's meditation. Meditate, meditate, meditate. And let no thing come between you and your meditation. So what have I said? I've said that you can go around the entire world and if your ego and your blinders are on you will see nothing. But what you can see through that very, very, very narrow vision But if you have humility and are willing to ask questions of others, you will learn an enormous amount. In the early 90s, we were in um, Thailand and landed in Bangkok late at night and drove from the airport into the downtown city. Now I should back up and say I grew up in my teens in Chicago, in a part of Chicago where on every corner there was a newspaper stand and the newspaper stand was built out of aluminum and the man or woman who was there sold newspapers and magazines and cigarettes and cigars and things of that nature. And so that's what I had seen all my life is those. Back to Thailand. We're driving down the street, driving down the highway, and there are rows. I see. We've driven a mile, two miles, and there are these aluminum shacks. I can see these shacks. And I thought, well, they can't all be selling newspapers. I really had that thought. And then I thought, well, maybe it's a shopping place. And so I asked the driver, what, what is this? You know, is this a shopping center? No, ma'am. Those are homes. That's where people are living. This is a whole community here where people are living. Few days later, we went down to Sirasha, down by the, the sea, and walked along the waterfront. And there, close up, you could see homes built out of these aluminum. No privacy, but coverage from the sun and the rain. What did I learn? Well, you know, that was the beginning. I mean, you go to India and you see very different things also. Both joy-filled and not so joy-filled. But what was that moment for me? And maybe you'll find your own moment like that. I saw for the first time a concrete example of a life experience I'd had from about 12 till maybe 18, 20, where in the neighborhood I lived in, every one of those buildings was only the newspaper stand. Nobody lived in those buildings. Nobody would have thought of living there. And so there was a, a solid thought form in my mind, a solid thought form that blocked off seeing that that was life experiences that others could have. It took 
traveling and seeing that, and then seeing people living on the street, which now you see all over the world, to change that thought form. And so I'm trying to say, and what I have said is, be open, be curious, be enthusiastic, learn from others, learn from yourself, and adjust to the new circumstances of your life. And recognize that when something new happens, you have to adjust. Clinging to the old is not helpful. Clinging to the old ideas is not helpful. Adjust to the new circumstances. And recognize that they too will change. Adapt to them. You need to put on a coat, put on a coat. And then in time, you will become one with. You will acclimatize to it. You will learn how to live with it. All of this is for one thing, my beloved. One thing. For you to find your own enlightenment. For you to find a life that is greater, filled with greater joy, greater compassion. As my guru would say, or just be happy. Be happy. Be content. And stop fighting. Stop fighting the others. Stop fighting. your birthright, incarnating into this beautiful human life, is to become, to find santosha, contentment. You have the capacity, you have the right. And some of you I know are feeling right now like you had dreams that have not come true. But I tell you, life's delays are not life's denials. Do you hear? The delays are not the denials. They may not come in this lifetime, but they will come unto you. You may not have a husband and children in this lifetime. But if you really want that in your next lifetime, you will. Help all of those who you see who have what you want. Bless them. Bless them mentally. Bless them, bless them, bless them. Wish them goodness and happiness. And it will come to you. And now, let us meditate together. That we might each find what we need in the moment of change. That you might find that which you need to bring ever greater joy into your life. Sit with your spine erect and focus your attention at the sun center. Turning your head to the left, exhale twice. And bring the head back to the center, beginning to watch your breath. Use the sipping breath. Pull the energy from the limbs to the trunk. from the trunk to the spinal column. From the base of the spine to the sun center. Move that energy as a golden ball of light in front of you. And sweep it around your body three times encasing your entire being in golden light. And now ascend upward 
ascend above the room you were in, above the building, above the continent. Ascend high, as high as you are able. Until you reach the grove of the meditators, attaining this high place, you see in front of you a path leading up the mountain. You enter the path, walking through an open forest. In front of you is a meadow, teeming with butterflies and birds of all different colors. The path continues through the meadow. It gently ascends upward. You re-enter the forest. You can hear the water from the stream near you. The moss softly upon your feet. The flowers and berries lining the path. see in front of you a brilliant light. The path opens to a clearing. Radiant light. Within the light you see a shrine. It is perfect for you. As you enter the, the shrine, the light begins to grow ever brighter. You're drawn to the back of the shrine. Quietude fills. You see a pool of light. Walk into the pool. Your shoes and clothing begin to dissolve away. You walk back to the waterfall of light, standing under the waterfall of light. Pouring down from the heavens, the light pours over your crown center. Filling every cell of your being, washing over you, washing through you. The golden 
dew drops pouring down. The karma dissolving away. The difficult karmas, the obstacles dissolve. Ananda. Ananda. As the light pours upon you and fills every cell of your being, your astral body begins to ascend a slight amount, to levitate, becoming lighter and lighter. Walking forth from the light, clothed anew, vivified, cleansed, revitalized. Breathing in the light, filling every cell of your being with the light. forth from the shrine, knowing you may come back here every day, anytime you wish, to stand in the light. Focusing your attention at the sun center. Returning to the high place of meditation. As this mantra is chanted, feel the blessings. Sarasvataye Namaha Ramanandam Paramasukatam Kevalam Yanamurtim 
avadidan trigona hitam sarguruntam tam namame chaitanya mahasatam shantam nirakalam nirandalam nada bindu kalatitam Asmai Shri Gurave Namaha Dhyana Mulam Guru Muti Pucha Mulam Guru Padam Mantra Mulam Guru Vakyam Moksha Mulam Guru Kripa Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Deva Maheshwara, Guru Sachar Parabrahma, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. Dhyana Mulam Guru Muti, Pucha Mulam Guru Padam, Mantra Mulam Guru Vakyam, Moksha Mulam Guru Kripa Om Namah Shivaya Gurave Satchitananda Murtaye Nishprapanjaya Shantaya Niralambaya Tejase Om Gum Guru Vyo Be thou blessed, be thou blessed, be thou triply blessed. Become an ever greater blessing unto all of those who enter your aura. May your life be filled with santosha, with wisdom, with compassion, with nonviolence. And may you share that with life. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Namaste. I thank you for the blessings of your presence. I thank you for your beautiful meditative energy today. Be blessed. It is wonderful to see your faces. It is wonderful to share this meditation time with you. Take the joy, take the bliss with you as you walk through your day. Namaste. And if the weather is cold, put on a coat. If it's raining, use an umbrella. If it's muddy, wear boots. <laughs>